which sounds not necessarily like something that we learned to do in medical school in our medical training, <laughs> which is probably a good thing because I don't, if you have me walk the streets of West Baltimore and say to somebody, put down your gun, <laughs> I don't think that's gonna go very well. I think people will laugh at me. Um, but when you have individuals who are from that community, who are recognized as a leader in that community, and who also, everybody knows that they have literally walked in the shoes of the people that they're interacting with. That voice is extremely powerful. They are the real credible messengers. In the same way that if I said to a mom, to a new mom, don't have your child sleep on their stomach, it may not carry the same weight as if it's somebody from their community. So that's the work that we do. But we think about health, not just about what happens when that patient is shot and what do I do with that gunshot wound, but we think about how can we rewind and see the person who is the victim of violence also as potentially a perpetrator? How can we look and see what is it that we could have done to prevent that gun from being fired in the first place? And that, I think, is the expanded role of public health, but also more generally, the role of health that's different but very complementary to health care. I'm going to give you a third example, a third thing, a third set of things to, to think about. And I want to tell you a story. And this is a story that happened after the unrest last April. So I think that all of you know about what happened when after Freddie Gray, who was an unarmed 25-year-old African-American man, died while in police custody. And then subsequently we had riots. And the riots involved hundreds of cars being burned and involved over 13 of our pharmacies being looted and burned and closed, leaving, as you can imagine, hundreds of our most vulnerable individuals, including our seniors, without access to medications. So I had all these, I mean, these are things that people outside of healthcare don't really think about, right? People see the images of you throwing bricks and that's the problem that appears. But we saw a totally different side, which is I had patients calling me to say that they stopped eating because they were out of insulin and thought that that was the best way to prevent themselves from going into decay, right? Or I had patients calling, I had one woman call me, call us in the health department to say that she couldn't breathe, but she was speaking like this in maybe one word sentences. And I thought, okay, maybe the medication she's out of is her inhaler. She was out of two medications, as it turns out. Coumadin and Lovenox, blood thinners, because she had a pulmonary embolism. And she was literally dying because of this clot in her lungs that was growing. And so, I mean, this became a life and death issue for us, but also for so many other people, patients, who, now it wasn't just about food access, or about medication access, it was also about food. That if you rely on your corner store for all your food, and that's not good in the, at the best of times because it's not healthy food, but now you don't have any food. And so we had to figure out a way to get people the food and medications that they really needed. And so my staff and I set up, within a few days, we set up a medication access line, a 24-7 prescription access line, where anybody could call us and we would figure out how to get medications to them. I mean, frankly, it was very frustrating at the time because I'm sure all of you understand the time what I was hearing from, some, from other individuals in the city was, well, I don't see the reason. Because there are other pharmacies in Baltimore, there are other grocery stores in Baltimore, why can't people just figure out how, how to go there? All right, for me as a physician, I, can, I have the resources, I can transfer my prescription from CVS to Walgreens. I have a car, I've got people, other people I know who have cars who can drive me around if I need to. But imagine if you are an 80-year-old woman in a wheelchair dependent on oxygen, and you're watching the news and it looks like the world is burning down around you. It's pretty difficult to figure out what medication you need and how you can get that. So it was frustrating to get it set up and to overcome that barrier that people who don't face those access issues may, may have. But we set up the line, and here's where the story begins. So I remember with my staff, we went door to door. And we wanted to, in particular, go to our, um, our senior buildings and other areas that were the most heavily affected. And so we went door to door, knocked on doors, and let people know about our prescription access program. We got two questions. This was two days after the unrest. We got two questions. 
First question, what candidate is this for? <laughs> Note, this was a year ago. This was not even during our crazy election time as we have now. Second question we got after what candidate is this, which really stunned me. Second question, what survey is this? Because we think we filled out a survey last week. Now, our residents weren't trying to be facetious or angry or sarcastic. They weren't trying to take anything out of me. But these were genuine questions. And they had already opened their door. But they were expressing something to me that I will never forget, which is that they were expressing that they always saw us, whoever us is, the system, the city, whatever you know, well-meaning people, they saw us as always being there for our needs and not for theirs. They always saw, they saw, they were expressing that they saw us there for this form of drive-by compassion, where we swoop in and we say, we know what you need, fill out the survey. But then we don't come back and say, well, here's how the survey has impacted the services that you're asking for. Right? Or we say, we have a candidate, but we don't explain actually what this is for. We only show up, and we certainly saw this in Sandtown and in West Baltimore. We saw all the media there at a time when it was helpful to the media to be there. But when the cameras left, so did the attention, so did the funding, so did the help that was offered at the time. And so it just was a very humbling moment to see that from a community at this time of extreme need. And something else happened that I think is a corollary to this too. This is the problem, the third issue that I'm articulating. The third, the other related issue, I remember going to a community meeting when I first started my job, which I have to say is a very humbling job because of all these experiences that I have where I feel like I know, I feel like I know something, but then I come into these meetings and realize I know nothing. You know, my agency, the nickname for my agency is the Agency of Bugs, Drugs, and Sex, the health department. And I was um, attending a youth meeting, and I was asked by the group to speak about issues that impacted youth, and I thought, oh, I know what they're gonna talk about. They're gonna talk about STDs, they're gonna talk about you know, smoking and drugs, and I kind of, I made that assumption. These are eight to 15 year olds, about 30 eight to 15 year olds. And I began speaking about these topics and I could see they were fidgeting and not really paying attention. And so I asked them, what do you think are the health issues that you see? What are the problems that you're seeing that we're not addressing? What should I be addressing instead? Without exception, these kids said one thing. And that one thing I could not in a million years have predicted, certainly would not have been in my top 10 list of things that I thought. The one thing that they all mentioned was mental health. Nobody said mental health, but this is what they talked about. They talked about trauma. They talked about the trauma of being handcuffed in the school cafeteria in front of all their friends and thrown into the back of a police car. They talked about the trauma of growing up so poor that they wouldn't know whether they would have a roof over their heads or a meal that night. They talked about the trauma and just the uncertainty of not knowing why they should wake up in the morning when nobody else in their family wakes up because everybody else is addicted to drugs. And I think it's that experience that totally changed our priorities and made me realize if I came in and said to our kids and our families that, oh, we need to talk about smoking cessation and we have to talk about childhood obesity, if they can't even see living past age 16, how is my message getting through? And it's, that, it's through that framework of understanding the assumptions that we're making and how much that's not helping our community. In fact, that's leading to distrust in our community. When we come in and the first thing they say is, what candidate is this? That's not illustrating much trust or buy-in. So we've completely shifted how we do things. You know, we in public health tend to think that, in healthcare, tend to think that we are on the side of right because we have data, we have science, we have evidence, and we say, well, here's what you have to do. Here's the life expectancy data. But if I said to my community, our goal is to increase life expectancy, they will look at me and say, well, when are we gonna see that? Right, we're not going to be able to see those results for a long time, so how can you show me, in the meantime, that you're hearing what I'm saying. If I say our goal is to reduce childhood obesity, they'll say, well, but how are you gonna do that? Don't just tell me about what not to eat. What, I don't have the option to do that. 
Or if I talk about addiction and say our goal is to stop addiction, they'll say, well, what are you doing about this right now? How can we save the lives of people who are dying right now? And so what we've decided to do, what we, um, and, and I, don't, I would have never been able to articulate this until we really listen and again, quite a humbling experience to acknowledge all that we don't know. But we've said, let's set these long-term goals, and the long-term goals could be life expectancy, they could be smoking cessation, they could be all these things that we know are important. But we have to have short-term metrics that our community define as the ones that are the most important. So we've said, we understand obesity is a big problem, the driver of heart disease and all these other issues that we know are killing our residents, but if we cannot show that we can do something now, you're not gonna believe that we can do this long-term goal. And what our residents have identified is they said, we want fresh fruits and vegetables. So we've started nine sites across our city called virtual supermarkets, where we deliver food and groceries to individuals living in these food deserts. We've partnered with our corner stores and we've gotten 10 of our corner stores, soon to be 20, to be healthy corner stores. We realize that they actually wanna do the right thing but they don't know about refrigeration, they don't know how to implement it, so we're helping them do that. We're saying, we understand that we're not going to be able to solve addiction overnight, and that this is a much longer term issue of getting treatment and treatment on demand, but in the meantime, we've trained over 11,000 people in our city on how to use naloxone. And beginning in October of last year, I issued a standing order, we got legislation changed, so I, I issued a blanket prescription for naloxone, to 620,000 residents of our city. You know, there's a long way for us to go. But I want to give you one quote to think about as I close. And that quote is something I heard in the wake of the Orlando gun violence, it, that I can't speak about without being emotional because this is one of these things that just doesn't make sense. But anyway, I don't want to get too, too political here. Um, but I heard Senator Cory Booker from New Jersey say the following. And he was specifically referring to gun control, but I think it can apply to any other issue. He said, we cannot allow our inability to do everything to undermine our determination to do something. And we cannot allow our inability to do everything to undermine our determination to do something. So where it is that we should start? Three ideas. First, it's our job to make the case for health. Not just health care, but for health. Nobody else is going to be thinking about health, but we are the ones who have to say, if what you care about is education, then we have to care about the fact that our children should start their schools with glasses, with shots, without lead poisoning. Right? We have to make that case that health is tied to everything. If what you care about is jobs, you want a healthy workforce. If what you care about is criminal justice system and crime, then you also have to think about our policies of mass arrest and incarceration when it comes to drugs. I mean, we are the ones who have to make the case for health and the fact that there is no such thing as a non-health sector. Second, we have to speak up and use our voice. And we look at the example of the beer bombs, we look at the example of our group health leaders now and in the past and say, these things are not easy. And many times there is a huge risk, a personal risk, a professional risk that may be involved in speaking out. I mean, I knew, and my staff knew, that in our declaring, for example, that violence is a public health issue, that poverty is a public health issue, that racism is a public health issue, that there might be repercussions, that people might say to us, what are you doing? You know, what are you talking about? Why are we talking about these issues? We, but sometimes we have to put ourselves on the line, and even our reputations on the line, if we know that we're doing the right thing at the end of the day. Third, I strongly believe that we in health, as we're talking about social determinants and other issues, should not just be asking for a seat at the table. We should be asking to be at the head of every table because we're the ones who are tying everything together. And you know, every time if there's a new policy that's being announced, we would always ask for the fiscal impact of that policy. Why shouldn't we ask for the health impact of every policy. Everything also impacts health. 
And we are the ones who have to talk about that. We have to talk about how, for example, housing is a healthcare intervention. Universal pre-K education is a housing or is, is a health intervention. And therefore, the other way around too, that health and having good health is tied to everything else. So I'll end by saying that ultimately, my strong belief is that our job as clinicians, our job as community members, our job as people who care is to preserve the dignity and respect the humanity of all people. And of all people, it doesn't matter if they have mental illness, if they have addiction, if they are experiencing homelessness, if they're otherwise someone that society would rather not see or that society would rather cast aside. And actually, I would add even more to that and say that our job should be even more to care for our most vulnerable and to level the playing field of inequality. And all of us have a responsibility to do this. We have the responsibility to be the strong voice, to be the advocate, to be the person who meets people where they are, to break down these silos, to set that North Star, and really engage with people in the way that they have defined. None of this at all is easy. But I would wager that none of us entered our current fields because it's easy. And we're all here because the work that we do is so important, that it's about health, therefore it's about life and death, but also about justice and civil rights as well. You know, it's been said that the disparities, the, uh, that disparities, especially health disparities, that they bend the arc of justice. And therefore, I also believe that public health can be our powerful tool in social justice, one that we can all use today with urgency, compassion, and action. And so I'm extremely honored to be here. I see it as a profound privilege to be able to join all of you here, all of you who are making a tremendous difference every day in your communities, in your city, with your patients. And I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and for your wonderful work. Thank you. Thank you, Lima. That was, that was wonderful. We, we have some time, and uh, we can take some questions from the audience. We have a couple of runners who have mics. So uh, if you want to ask Dr. Wen a question or make a comment, uh, just raise your hand, and I'll try to see you through the lights here. Uh, and has, has anybody got uh, sure mic up here? <clears throat> you, can, you can use my mic. Well, Dr. Wynn, um, I just had to stand up and thank you. I'm Patty Hayes, the director of public health here. Oh, so it's really nice I, to meet you. <laughs> How are you? I, oh my um, goodness. I have been soaking in everything you've said. It's so relevant to the struggle that we're having in Washington State, and I think the message that you're bringing about both the role of the social determinants of health, how we need to think about things. In, in King County, I'm proud to say there's been some of these things that you've challenged us with that, that we've started that, that made me want to jump up and go, but I know we have a long way to go, and so I just want to thank you for your leadership and the voice that you're bringing for the whole system, because that's what we have to address is the system together. So thank you so much. Thank you. Can I just say, okay. We, we talked so, about you last night at dinner, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so I was just at a conference in, in Colorado, and your name came up multiple times as an example of an exemplary leader. And I have to say, I mean, for all of you, I, I think this is one of the, when, whenever we're in, so wherever we're in someone's hometown, their hometown is probably like, yeah, oh, we see her all the time. This is how people are in Baltimore. They're like, yeah, Lita Wed, I see her all the time. But you don't know, many of you may not know how amazing of a leader Patty Hayes is considered across the country as a leader in public health. So thank you. Thank you, Patty. Anybody else with a hand up? I'm, I'm a little blinded by the light here. Where? Oh, great. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> Greg Simon. 
Thanks very much. I, thinking about the beginning of your talk and the story you told, and the middle of your talk talking about infant mortality, you know, the, the thought that came to me is that passion comes from stories, but accountability does come from numbers. Yes. And, and I'd be interested in your thoughts about, as you're trying to do sort of community-wide improvement, how do you balance sort of passion and numbers? It's a very good, oh, here. Uh, <laughs> all right, I'll have multiple microphones, okay. thank you. Um, it's a very good question. I heard Ta-Nehisi Coates talk about this actually at a, um, at, a, uh, at a recent event, and he is such a, he really understands, I think, that balance. And so I wanted to hear his answer, and I wanted to share that with you. Actually, I'll tell you that I, I feel like I have no original thoughts. All my ideas come from, from, from other people, but I'm glad to be able to share it. Um, what he said that really resonated with me, he said, before people can care about the numbers, they have to feel the pain. And I think that the numbers are really important to justify what we do to make sure that, I mean, I, I, I'm a researcher as well. I mean, I was a formerly an academic, an acad I'm a recovering academician, I don't know, but, um, <laughs> so I fully, but I fully believe, um, I fully believe in the value of research and numbers and having metrics and clear goals and being able to justify the work that we do and therefore we're able to share best practices. And you see that I cite some numbers in my, in my talk about BMO for Healthy Babies, for, 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 for example. But I think unless people feel the pain and the stories are what help share that pain, that they won't relate to those numbers. So I think it is really marrying the stats together with our stories. Thank you. Other comments or questions from the audience? There, there's a Dan Churkin back there. And uh, just bring the mics over to the potential questioners. And, uh, <clears throat> Uh, I very much enjoyed your inspirational presentation, uh, and I'm, I guess, a non-recovering researcher at this <laughs> point. I, I think, I'm just wondering, as you're talking about a, the most disadvantaged sector of society, where public health is focused, is there really a fundamental difference mm. in the uh, orientation, in the lack of a broad understanding of what health is in general that pervades the entire society. And is that, is a greater appreciation of what health really is and the social and psychological factors that affect health, uh, if that can change more broadly in the society, do you think that will be helpful in having more appreciation of what it really means to be very disadvantaged? That's an extremely thoughtful question, and I hope I can give you somewhat of a thoughtful answer, because this is another one of these things that's a work in progress for me. I don't have the answer. I'll just tell you what my current thinking about it is, and feel free to, for those of you who have microphones, feel, please feel free to add to it as well. You know, I'll share with you another experience. When I first came to the health department, I remember one of my first community meetings Again, this is one of these experiences that I look back and I say, what was I thinking at the time? But I thought I would come to the community meeting, introduce myself as the new health commissioner and talk about what it means to be healthy or something. I don't, that's what I had in mind. And I came and, I, and uh, the first person raised her hand before I could start talking, which was a good thing, and said, Tell, I, I need you to address the biggest pressing health problem in Baltimore. And I said, what is that? She said, rats. Rats, trash. I go to community meetings. I'm sure Patty Case can tell you about this too. We, I go and people talk about health either as those other things that impact their life, you know, the things that are very immediate, like the rats, the trash, the potholes, or they'll say, they'll talk about health care. They'll talk about the experience that they had in a hospital or not being able to get an appointment for something because that's how people understand health. So I do think that there is a fundamental misunderstanding about what health is but I don't put the blame on our society or on any party, except it means that we in the health fields should be doing a much better job of messaging it. And also, health care in particular, the health care system ha must message it better as well. 
you know, I go to a lot of fundraisers, I'm sure you all do too, for various hospitals and health systems, and I understand why they do this. I mean, having come from a hospital and a health system, I understand that how you will get funding for your new trauma center is to show the patients whose lives were saved because, um, be, because of some new surgery and procedure and the great people who are there, I get that. But I think it's also because of that messaging that we understand health as healthcare. And our solutions then end up targeting our most vulnerable individuals with health care. And a brand new dialysis center is great and maybe the right thing for that community. But what if we said, how can we keep people from getting diabetes and getting kidney problems in the first place? Thank you, Leanne. That's wonderful. And I think we should all thank Lena again for the wonderful uh, presentation she made.